Turn with me please to the 51st chapter of the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 51. This is one of those most uh, beautiful and memorable Psalms. If you were to ever ask anybody who has studied the history of preaching this question, which is the most preached from book in the Bible? It is the book of Psalms. There is no book in the Bible that has been more sermonized from and more studies drawn from than the book of Psalms. Even Robert Murray McShane in his system of Bible study for the year keeps us in the Psalms for 60% of the time. He says it's good for the soul to keep your spirit sensitive to sin and to confess sin when God speaks to you about it. And here is David, and I'd like to read for you the first few verses, and then we shall pray together and enter into this sermon. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I have been a sinner from birth. Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness and let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Will you pray with me, please? Father, how many times this psalm has been such a present help. It's deep anguish, it's pathos, it's words, it's remorse strike a chord with many of us. And yet, Lord, if David could fall into such terrible moments of iniquity and despair, it is easy for us to do the same. And yet I rejoice not because he fell, but because in your mercy you were able to refer to him as a man after your own heart. Teach us, Lord, his wisdom and keep us from his errors. In Christ's name, amen. I'm going to be looking at David as a husband and a father. And as I do that, I would like to read for you a few paragraphs from a biographical sketch. Many of you will recognize it. I borrow it from a couple of authors, and I read it for you. He began his life with all the classic handicaps and disadvantages. His mother was a powerfully built, dominating woman who found it difficult to love anyone. She had been married three times and her second husband had divorced her because of violence in the home. The father of the child I'm describing was her third husband and had died of a heart attack a few months before the child's birth. As a consequence, the mother had to work long hours from his earliest childhood. She gave him no affection, no love, no discipline and no training during those early years. She did not allow him to call her at work. Other children had little to do with him so he was alone most of the time. He was absolutely rejected from his earliest childhood. He was ugly and poor, untrained and unlovable. When he was 13 years old, a school psychologist commented that he probably didn't even know the meaning of the word love. During adolescence, the girls would have nothing to do with him and he fought constantly with the boys. Despite a high IQ, he failed academically and finally dropped off during his third year of high school. He thought he might find a new acceptance in the Marine Corps, for they reportedly built men, and he wanted to be one. But his problems went with him. The other Marines laughed at him and ridiculed him. He fought back, resisted authority, was court-martialed, and thrown out of the Marines with an undesirable discharge. So there he was, a young punk in his early 20s, absolutely friendless and shipwrecked. He was a small and scrawny man. He had an adolescent squeak in his voice. He was balding, had no talent, no skill, no sense of worthiness. He didn't even have a driver's license. Once again, he thought he could run from his problems, so he went to a foreign country to live. He was rejected there too, for nothing had essentially changed. While there, he married a girl who herself had been an illegitimate child and brought her back to America with him. 
Soon she began to develop the same contempt for him that everyone else displayed. She bore him two children, but he never enjoyed the respect and status that a father should have. His marriage continued to crumble. His wife demanded more and more things that he could not provide. And instead of being his ally against the bitter world as he had hoped she would become, she became his most vicious opponent. She could outfight him and learn to bully him. Finally, she forced him to leave and he tried to make it on his own and was dreadfully lonely. After days of solitude, he went home and literally begged her on his knees to take him back. He surrendered all pride. He crawled. He accepted humiliation and came back on her terms. Despite his meager salary, he brought her $78 as a gift, asking her to take it and spend it any way she wished. She laughed at him. She belittled his feeble attempts to supply his family's needs and ridiculed his failure. On one occasion, she made fun of his sexual impotency in front of a friend, at which point he fell on his knees and wept bitterly as the greater darkness of his private nightmare enveloped him. Finally, in silence, he pleaded no more. No one had ever wanted him. He was perhaps the most rejected man of our time. His ego lay shattered in a fragmented dust. The next day he was a strangely different man. He arose, went to the garage, took down a rifle he had hidden there, carried it with him to a newly acquired job at a book storage building, and from a window on the third floor in that building, shortly after noon, November 22, 1963, he sent two shells crashing into the head of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Lee Harvey Oswald, the rejected, unlovable failure, killed a man who to him more than any other man on earth embodied all the success, beauty, wealth, and family affection which he lacked and so dreadfully longed for. When you read a little sketch like that, and frankly, I have not investigated into the details, I do not know to what extent this is true and what is imagined and what is stretched. I really have no idea. I'm just borrowing it from a couple of writers, one of whom is a psychologist, and many a secular behaviorist psychologist who would subscribe to the deterministic theory of human personality, meaning the fact that you and I are totally the product of our environment, we cannot really rise above it, in a sense we are shackled to the home in which we are raised, A behaviorist or a determinist could take this kind of a biodata sketch and drive home his point to almost any degree he wants to drive it and prove the fact that Lee Harvey Oswald really did not stand a solitary chance in being a successful husband and a father. In one sense, it would almost be relieving to find out that this is true. Because then in that instance, you could explain away all of the criminalities that are born out of homes where violence is a daily routine. In that sense, you could explain away many, many, many derelict people whose family life did not give them an option. But please listen to me carefully. The Bible denounces the determinist and firmly teaches that every human being, please hear me now, every human being, has within him that God-given ability to rise above his environment or to shrink beneath it by virtue of the fact that God has created man in his image and through general revelation and special revelation, God is able to speak to an individual, show him what is right and what is wrong. And I can point to you young people today who've been raised in homes of complete turmoil, whose very spirits are so gentle and sensitive to truth and to the beauty of God. David apparently had everything going for him, but he made two or three cardinal mistakes. And I do not want to be hard on him because any one of us could have made those mistakes. So if you'll bear with me as I see that negative aspect and then end on that tremendous strength that David had, I would like to speak to you on how God is able to help you make your home and your family the kind of family he wants it to be. See, David, the Bible reminds us, had a tremendous pursuit of affection for one particular woman. He had met her in her days of marriage to somebody else, and David saw this woman, Abigail, in a very unique setting. This is the way it had happened. David had uh, a group of young men who surrounded him. These young men voluntarily protected the wealthy people and the land and the cattle that they owned. So this is what they would do. They would ward off marauding bands and at the end of their service would go to the wealthy landowners and take an offering of love. 
It was a voluntary offering, but at the same time, it was understood that you would give in proportion to your own prosperity. There was a wealthy man in the land by the name of Nabal. Nabal in Hebrew means fool. And he decided to live up to his name. He lived like a fool most of his life. David sent his young men to Nabal's home. And Nabal rejected these young men and said, who does David think he is? You go back to David and tell him I owe him absolutely nothing. David was a young man, uh, impetuous I suppose. And he says, if Nabal doesn't know who I am, he's going to find out today. So he saddles up his donkeys, takes all of his friends, and rides in the direction of Nabal. Somebody goes to Abigail, and I have no explanation for this. I suppose there were lots of arranged marriages then too. I do not know how a fool like uh, Nabal ended up with a wife like Abigail. The Bible says she had two tremendous strengths to her. One, she was a beautiful woman. Number two, she was a wise and a godly woman. That kind of combination was virtually irresistible. She hears what has happened. She hears David is riding in Nabal's direction. She hears that uh, Nabal is going to be killed by David. And rather than saying serves him right... She saddles up her own donkeys, rides in the direction of David, intercepts him and says this, David, my husband is a fool and he's dealt wrongly with you. But there is going to be only one bigger fool in this land today and David, that's going to be you. And the reason that will be you is because you're going to draw blood and God has anointed you for a special task. Let not your hands drip with blood, David. What is it you want? Gold, silver, food, clothing. Take everything we owe you, but please spare my husband. David was virtually stunned by that miniature speech. He couldn't believe what he'd heard. He was literally staggered by it. He picked Abigail off the dust of the earth and told her not to be uh, troubled about it. He was not going to pursue her husband anymore. David turned around and went back to his home. But David was never able to get Abigail out of his mind. Abigail goes back home. She wants to talk to Nabal because he's been so foolish in what he did. But she sees him drunk and she waits till the next morning till he is sober. This is probably the only principle I would like to leave with the women because I think it's an important one. Advice is good. But if good advice is to be effective, it should be timed rightly. And ladies, please believe me, particularly with the fragile nature of men. They are unable to admit their need, and one of the reasons altars are more often lined with women than with men is because men find it very hard to admit that they need the advice that has just been given to them. It's true for most of us. She waits till the next morning, talks to Nabal. Nabal is troubled with what he hears. Ten days later, he falls sick and dies. I have no application to make at this point, other than the fact that he died. And somebody comes to David and says, do you know that Nabal is dead? David's first response is, aha, Abigail is a widow. So he immediately sends for her. David wasn't broken hearted about this uh, severance at all. He sends for Abigail and asks her to come and meet him. Abigail comes and David proposes marriage to her. And she, in a very tremendous display of genuine humility falls onto the ground and she says, David, I'm not worthy of marrying a man of your stature. And he, in the Hebrew description, it's a beautiful word. The idea that is conjured up in the mind is his placing his hand under her chin and lifting up her countenance to hold herself up high. Lifts her up and he tells her that he loves her and desires to be wedded to her and they both are married. In one sense, this has all the thrill of romance that you'd want to have. Here is a good man, here is a good woman, unfortunately related to a fool somehow. That marriage came to an end. David pursues Abigail and they are wedded. Ironically, two things happen immediately after this. I don't understand it, but the very next verse, immediately after we are told David married Abigail, it tells us he also married another woman. William Barclay, the Scottish theologian, has rightly said that polygamy is only a Greek word for a dunghill. I think he's right. And David entered into this polygamous relationship. And interestingly enough, 
As far as I know, the only other major reference to Abigail after this marriage is that she bore him a child. I'm going to say something now that if I do not explain it properly, some of you will misunderstand. But I think you men will be right with me when I say this. I'm confused about this issue and I have no simple way to explain it. I do not know why it is that man has this tremendous pursuing ability within him. And I mean man in the sense of the male. He has this tremendous pursuing ability within him to pursue and pursue and pursue and try his best in every winsome nature of kindness and generosity and tenderness and all of this to pursue the woman of his dreams and the girl that he wants to be wedded to him, the girl he wants to call his wife. I don't understand how some men can pursue that woman for months and some for years and years and years. And once they have married that person, it is like the African chieftain who has now conquered new territory and is bored because he has no more territories to conquer. This is a fundamental mistake within the male ego. And this is the problem as I see it. The mistake is this. We make that dangerous assumption that love consists of conquering rather than pursuing. Follow what I'm saying? We think once we have conquered, that sense of victory is there, and that sense of romance no longer need to be. I don't need to win her anymore. I don't need to impress her anymore. I don't need to pursue her anymore. And yet, if I understand the biblical passage, and when you look at the New Testament scriptures, by the way, particularly as you read the book of Ephesians, and you begin to see the Apostle Paul drawing a parallel, I was studying that beautiful passage this morning. The Apostle Paul begins that grand epistle of Ephesians talking about the glorious person of Jesus Christ. In all of his adjectives and descriptions, he is hardly able to nudge at the reality of who Christ is. And after he finishes describing who Christ is, he then comes to us as believers and tells us who we are because of Jesus. All right? Who Christ is and who we are because of Christ. And once he has taken that whole relationship, he moves into the area of dwelling in unity, one with the other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And then he comes to that climactic passage of man and woman living as husband and wife. And he says, I am using this as a description and an analogy of the very bridegroom who is Jesus, who has pursued us and sets us in those heavenly places and talks about how he continues to love us in spite of what we were at one time. And he says we must understand this is an illustration of Christ's love for his people. Jesus Christ never stops pursuing you and me. And may I challenge you, may I challenge you as a husband to bring the romance back into your life by continuing to pursue the one you claim to love. One of the very difficult aspects of my ministry, if there were anything I would want to change in my life, it would be my travel load. And please believe me, I'm doing my best to change it. I just do not like the fact that I'm scattered hither and yon and all over the place. As a result, you're away so often unwillingly from the ones whom you dearly love. But I'll, before God say this to you, and the Lord is my witness, I have made every effort as an evangelist away so much to recognize and cherish that beautiful partner that God has given to me. And one of the principles I tried even at graduate level was at least once a week to take her out alone for a meal somewhere, either a lunch or a dinner, and let that romance and all the loveliness of it continue to reign in our hearts. Because if that is gone, marriage becomes a drudgery. David saw in Abigail that beauty. He saw in Abigail that wisdom. But once he'd got her, I have to wonder how much he gave her wisdom a chance to really influence him. How much he gave that beauty a chance really to dominate him. And sir, what I say to you is that if you were to look at the secular world today, they convince you that stolen waters are sweet. 
They try to tell you that every new experience is going to bring you something you never had before. There is a crass Spanish proverb that says, He who loves one woman has loved them all. He who loves many has loved none. Some of you will be seeing this story. Charlie Wiedemeyer was the Michigan State quarterback. Hawaii's athlete of the decade in the 60s offered lucrative professional football contracts and gave all those contracts up because he wanted to be in touch with young people and teach young people the the thrill and the discipline of playing football and became a coach. While he was traveling with a professional football team for a few days, suddenly felt dizziness and collapsed on the floor. I don't have all the details. When I went into his home, here's what I saw. This man was now laid up. What happened was tragically diagnosed to be Lou Gehrig's disease. Here's a man who cannot even talk. There is no voice in him. There is not even a whisper in him. And he coached the football team by mouthing the words through his lips. And his wife reads those words, gives it to the quarterback, and they go and play. And they won the championship. All of California is talking about Charlie Wiedemeyer. And when I went to see him laid up in bed... And he asked me if I would share some of my sermon illustrations with him. He'd been hearing about them through the week. And as I talked about the conversion of the Apostle Paul and telling him how Paul, what he thought was strong, turned out to be his weakness. What he thought was his weakness turned out to be his strength. And tears coming down through his, over his face as he clasped my hand and asked me to pray for him before we left. And won a triumphant victory he was facing that afternoon. But of all that happened... The one thing I will never forget, his lovely, attractive, strong, committed Christian wife, Lucy is her name, through all of the pain and the agony and the tragedies, hours and hours and hours of no sleep, many times all day by his side. The thing that I'll never forget is the way she would take his face in her hands and just talk to him and watch the mouthing of the words. You could see the love, the affection, and the commitment so deep, I walked out of there having witnessed a sermon in flesh and blood. Love, the wife of your youth, remain captivated by her love. David, the Bible reminds us, had a tremendous pursuit of affection for one particular woman. He had met her in her days of marriage to somebody else, and David saw this woman, Abigail, in a very unique setting. The Bible says she had two tremendous strengths to her. One, she was a beautiful woman. Number two, she was a wise and a godly woman. That kind of combination was virtually irresistible. In one sense, this has all the thrill of romance that you'd want to have. Here is a good man, here is a good woman, unfortunately related to a fool. Somehow that marriage came to an end. David pursues Abigail and they are wedded. Ironically, two things happen immediately after this. I don't understand it, but the very next verse, immediately after we are told David married Abigail, it tells us he also married another woman. Gentlemen, I have a very, very strong feeling in my heart that Solomon had a tremendous emotion in his heart when he wrote these words in the Proverbs. He says this, May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. May you ever be captivated by her love. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. May you ever be captivated by her love. If anything, he is seeing you as the conquered one. You now belong to this individual and that pursuit of love and romance must remain so. David saw in Abigail that beauty. He saw in Abigail that wisdom. But once he'd got her, I have to wonder how much he gave her wisdom a chance to really influence him. How much he gave that beauty a chance really to dominate him. I think what David lost out was that he had conquered her and then he thought that's all he needed to do. But please follow this principle very carefully. Sin has a ripple effect. You never ever sin alone. 
Because when you sin, you are changed. And when you are changed, you will affect somebody else. And when we talk about victimless crimes in our society, they may be legal, sociological, psychological terms. They are not biblical concepts. There is no such thing as a victimless crime. If I victimize myself some way in sin, I'm victimizing my children, you can be sure. Society is solid. It is connected. And the whole principle of Adam and Eve is the solidarity of man. As through one man sin came into the world, so shall righteousness ultimately to the person of Christ. But man is not dismembered from society. He is not an island. He is connected. And please notice how David's ripple effect is going to go through his home. As a matter of fact, when the Jews read the scriptures and their lectionaries, this incident is always read. It's the story of his children, and he had 21 of them. 20 of them were boys, one of them was a girl. The oldest was Amnon, the second was Tamar, and the third was Absalom. And these three were going to crush the heart of David, some willingly, some unwillingly. Amnon proved the point of G.K. Chesterton when he said this. He said, there are many, many angles at which you can fall, but only one angle at which you can stand straight. There are many, many angles at which you can fall, but only one angle at which you can stand straight. And what Chesterton really said was, if you start to fall into iniquity, there is no limit to the deviant ways you can find. Man will find more and more hellish ways to fall, and there's only one way in which to stand straight. Amnon decided to test the angles. Like a glutton after sensuality, nothing was ever going to satisfy him. He was insatiable in his desires. Till finally, the last boundary was going to fall, the boundary partially of incest. As he espied his own sister Tamar, he wondered how he could block her off into a situation where he could satisfy himself. Look at the angle at which he's going to fall now. He goes to his cousin and he says, how can I get Tamar alone? And the cousin says, what you do is go back home, pretend to be sick. Your father will come. He will offer you the servants. Say to your dad, I do not want the servants. Send me Tamar. She will take care of me. They had been studying David very carefully. They knew exactly how he would respond. Unfortunately, David, I guess, was so busy with the kingdom, he did not study his children that carefully. Amnon came back. Pretended to be sick. David came in and said, I'll send you the servants. He said, Dad, I really don't want the servants. Send me Tamar. He says, all right. Tamar comes. David is gone. The door is shut instantly. Promiscuity is to take over. And as Amnon looks into the eyes of Tamar, she looks at him with terror in her eyes and uses the Hebrew concept of rape when she says, please do not violate me. Please do not do this to me. Ask our father. Ask our father. He will give me to you. I think according to the law, she could have married him as her half-brother because they both had the common father. She said, ask our father, he will give me to you. He looks at her and says, that's not the way I want you. Young people, always beware of anyone who wants you without any commitment to you. Always beware of anyone who wants you without any commitment to you. She says that he says, that's not the way I want you. He consummates his desires. And finally, after he's consummated the desires, he tells her to get up and get out. Here's the other principle. You get into an illicit relationship, it'll instantly turn desire into disrespect, if not hatred. He tells her to get up and get out. She is disheveled. She's completely broken. She doesn't know what to do. The ultimate indignity has been thrust upon her by her own brother. She walks out of the room, doesn't know where to go, goes straight into the arms of her actual brother, Absalom, who loved her dearly, so dearly that when he had his first daughter, he called her Tamar, and with his arms wrapped around his own sister, he hears this hellish news of what has happened to her. He is angry, and Tamar says, look, just forget it, leave it, or there'll be bloodshed in this home. David finds out, Absalom finds out, with one difference, David is not going to do anything, so Absalom is. See, gentlemen, you and I live with this belief that if you ignore a problem in the home, it'll go away. It doesn't go away. I can tell you, even as a young dad, that when you've just brushed aside something and think it'll go away, it doesn't. It keeps cropping up, and each time, like, it seems to gather more momentum 
And I have met fathers who have said to me, if I had to do it all over again, I would have dealt with it right at the beginning when it was the easiest. David is not going to do anything, so Absalom lures his brother Amnon into a secluded setting and kills him. David now is so beside himself in confusion, he sends for Absalom. Absalom becomes afraid and runs away. He runs away, I believe, to the home of his uh, grandparents as he goes to live there for, I think it's two to three years. And finally, the general brings the father and son back together. They embrace one another. Little else is said. Absalom goes away for another two years. In five years, father and son have met once. And what started off as a single brick separating them now became a thick wall. And the son began to scheme against the father. And he says, you know, I need to overthrow my dad. If my father is no longer king, I can become king and do away with him. How does a son get to despise his father that much? He was going to do it. He lured him. uh, He tried in every way to see who would leave David. And this is where I find this utterly fascinating. To some of you, this may be news. The first one to leave David and betray him was the secretary of state, Ahithophel. Do you know who he was? He was the grandfather of Bathsheba. Check out the two passages of scripture in 2 Samuel 11 and 2 Samuel 23. You will see the connection. Eliam was the father of Bathsheba. Ahithophel was the father of Eliam. And I don't think it is accidental that Ahithophel leaves him, leaves David and goes in order to serve in Absalom's army. If that is not convincing enough, listen to this. Absalom goes to Ahithophel and says to him, can you give me one suggestion on how I can get my father to draw first blood and become the aggressor so that I can become the defender. And he says, all right, I can give you the perfect plan. If you want your father to become the aggressor and you to become the defender, he said, do this. Go to your father's palace and lie with your father's concubines and do so on the roof of his palace. Where was David when he first set eyes upon Bathsheba? You see the web that sin has spun and sin has bounced back. Sin has what the Australians would call a boomerang effect. You sin against somebody, they sin against you. You lie against somebody, they lie against you. You cheat somebody, they cheat you. And ultimately sin had completely boomeranged and come right back. David had deceived a man, now he was deceived by his close confidant. David had broken a home, now another man was breaking his home, separating father from son. Finally, the army of David has to pursue the army of Absalom. Absalom's rebellion has been quelled. In the process, Absalom has been killed. And probably to my mind, one of the saddest verses in Holy Scripture, as David kneeled down and cradled his son and said, O Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would to God that I had died for thee. And my humble suggestion to you is this. If Absalom could have talked he may have stopped and said, Dad, I really didn't want you to die for me, but I sure wish you'd lived a little bit for me. Everyone has temptations in his life of work, and mine could be something like this. I think it would be fair to say, if I wanted to be away from home every week of the year from now till the year 2000, I could accept some invitation. It would be very easy to do because one of the struggles of the male ego is right here. We tend to find our identity at our place of work. May I try and challenge you to try and test your identity at your home before you do it at your place of work. I'm sure it would be more impressive to God if we as Christian men were godly husbands and wives before we were chief executives of some great technological company. I am not painting an either-or, but some of us have made it an either-or. I don't think one has to be successful at home and be low down on the rung at work. That's not what I'm saying. But the hours and hours and hours we put into work, 
the study. And this is the subtlest of all snares in the ministry. You can spend hours and hours studying sermons and counseling other people's children and forgetting your own. I actually had a pastor uh, from Chicago, a Korean pastor, say to me once recently at a meeting, he said, I was reading the newspaper and my son kept calling me and calling me, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. He said it went from one year through to the other till finally my little boy stopped and said, Pastor Kim, can I speak to you? And what I'm saying is, can your children take you in their arms and know that when they are talking to you, you are listening to them. When they need you, you are available to them. With the eight, nine, ten hour days that you keep, if you don't influence your children, your neighbors will. If you don't influence your children, television will. If you don't influence your children, the humanistic, secularistic media will. If you don't influence your children, the system of education in this world will control them till they no longer even know what they believe anymore. And we are graduating students out of university who are able to argue one thing, why you cannot believe anything. And we send them to university to graduate them as skeptics. While we supposedly paid for them to get informed. Take that fragile little child right from the time they are, they are little, and take that impressionable character, because please hear me, children and personalities are not like quantities. Half a baby and half a baby do not make one baby. Half a slice of bread and half a slice of bread may make one slice of bread, but half a baby and half a baby make the mockery of a baby. It is no life at all. They are fragile personalities with the breath of God upon them. Let us raise them with the fatherliness that God intended for us to give to them. I make that plea in North America today because it is so easy for us to get so quickly into the fast lane and forget that there are some times we need to slow down because our children don't need to get onto that lane. You with me? He lost out in the pursuit of his romance. He lost out in the sense of controlling and giving the full the love and affection to his children. But what I really like about David, which I think challenges every other man, he was a king. He brought in the golden age of Israel. There are few names as revered by the Israeli mind today as King David. One of their best hotels is named after him. Many streets are named after him. So much of their history is dated from him. And David was that great name recognized really by the entire Middle Eastern world as one of those great names and great kings. With all of his pompousness, when Nathan came to him one day and told him what had happened and he pronounced the judgment himself and Nathan wagged his bony finger in his face and said, David, you are that man. David could have been like some kings and had Nathan executed. He could have been like some kings and abolished the seventh commandment. He could have been like some kings and said it's Bathsheba's fault. The grandest strength I find in this man is that when the word of God finally pierced the armor of his soul with all of his sensitivity, the sweet singer of Israel, this man who wanted so much to love God but found his heart to be a cauldron or, or a battleground, he buckled down his knee and he cried out, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies blot out my transgressions for my sin is ever before me against thee thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest cleanse me wash me make me clean then I will teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee gentlemen the first step to correcting any error is always the step of repentance. And unless we are willing to say, I was wrong, we will never know 
how to follow his right. Just so you don't get me wrong, please hear me. I do not believe that just because you raise up a son who becomes a derelict, therefore that means that you were a derelict. That's not what I'm saying. Sometimes I find it unexplainable that some children raised in good homes go so wrong. I don't know. I have a feeling that verse that says, bring up a child in the way that he shall go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The Hebrew actually lends itself to a reverse, which actually says this, bring up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, it will not depart from him. And I think it is just as easy to say that your upbringing will haunt him all his life. He will not be able to shake it off. Whatever. I don't want us to live in somebody else's guilt, but I want us to face up to our own. And I'm going to particularly invite fathers and mothers to make a commitment before Almighty God that we will be the kind of dads and mums that God wanted us to be, for in our homes we cradle ones who could change history. John Wesley. John Wesley was one of 19 children. Did you hear that? One of 19 children. Susanna, his mother, was the 27th of her parents. That was a busy home. (laughs) I'm not sure I'd want to do the dishes for that home every night. When you read the biography of Susanna Wesley, you will see an awesome power of God working in her life. Let me give you just this simple illustration. One day he says to her, Mother, John said to her, Can you give me a definition of sin? When you're studied up with God and close to God, it overflows within you. Listen to her definition to her son. She said, John, whatever weakens your reasoning, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes away your relish for spiritual things. In short, if anything increases the authority and the power of the flesh over the spirit, that to you becomes sin, however good it is in itself. How do you like that? I don't think a theologian would do better. If anything weakens your reasoning, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, or takes away your relish for spiritual things, in short, if anything increases the authority and the power of the flesh over the spirit, that to you becomes sin, however good it is in itself. Now, you want to see what John Wesley did in his lifetime? He preached 40,000 sermons. You know, that's an awful lot of sermons. He traveled 250,000 miles by horseback preaching the word of God. He worked with 15 different languages. At the age of 83, he was angry with his doctor because his doctor didn't let him preach more than 14 times a week. At the age of 86, written in Wesley's journals are these words, laziness is slowly creeping in. There's an increasing tendency to stay in bed after 5.30 in the morning. (laughs) You want to know what John Wesley did? Pick up a book called England Before and After Wesley. You will not believe it. You know who had that impact on his life? Susanna. Parents, we have in our homes those who can change nations. Let us pour our lives out into them. As a man who had lost out in his home, but I see that grand strength in him that was able to repent and make the best of his life. Dr. Graham said this, if he had to do it all over again, he'd read more, preach less, spend more time with his family. Why don't some of us make that commitment to be the husband and the father that God wants us to be so that as parents we can model a home for our children?